Welcome, everybody, for the first episode in this new read-long series. The book we are reading is called The Promise of Blood. It's the first of a trilogy in what we call the Powder Mage series. And this is book one, and it's by a guy named Brian McClellan. Now, if you haven't read this stuff yet, that's great. We're going to try to keep this spoiler-free as you read through it. So if you're making some comments, what I'd love for everybody, if you're reading along, or if you're just interested in what's going on, to throw ahead and add some comments in there. But let's keep them spoiler-free. So if you've read the series already, um, don't go too far ahead of the conversation as we go through it. We'll be going through it at least a chapter or two at a time, depending on how everything's going. And so we're going to test this format a little. If you guys are enjoying it, I'd love to hear your comments. If you're not a subscriber to the channel and you're enjoying this, I'd love to see you subscribe. So thanks everybody for checking out this first of a new series. And um, I guess we're just going to go get into it. Okay. Now, I'm going to approach this as if we know nothing, because even though I've read the trilogy before, I don't know what you guys know. And so it's been a while since I've read it, so I've forgotten most of what I've thought of anyway. So it's going to be a great experience as we're going into it. Okay, so The Promise of Blood, the Power Mage book series. Now, um, what I do feel comfortable saying is that this book series, if, you know, it's um, very steampunkish. Um, think of it being set in kind of like a... 1800s series, not quite Victorian England prior to Victoria, um, prior to Victorian. Think uh, like King George or later King George or during the Napoleonic uh, Revolution, the French Revolution type of era. And this could be, and a lot of this area is could be like in Europe. It could be France. It could be Germany. It could be um, Great Britain. But we are based in a country called Adro. Now this Adro country is surrounded by a full um, a full series of mountains. It has what they call a large sea right in the middle of the area, um, a few different forests, okay? And it's surrounded by some very dangerous um, countries like Kez and Novi that we'll experience at some point. I don't know a whole lot. And there's other parts of the world like Deliv, and we'll, exp and we'll get to know this as we go through it. So um, that's all the background I'm going to give you at this point. Um, we're starting off in the city of Adipest, and um, a couple of points I want to point out to you if on the map, on the screen, you're going to see a place called the Skyline Palace, and I believe that's where the story starts. So we're going to go ahead and start jumping into this as well. So first off, this is chapter one. Um, beginning, we get, we get introduced to this guy named Adamat. Apparently, he is an inspector. Okay, so like I said, this is kind of, um, you know, 18th century modern. So um, he's he, or should I say, a former inspector? Um, we learn that he's an Adipist, and Adipist is apparently a little bit, a little bit um, colder than Novi. And even Novi's very, very cold, so that we're starting out here in a carriage. And apparently Adipus has been summoned to the palace, the Skyline Palace. And so he's in a carriage, and he's going out that way. Now, it's noticed the next character mentioned is a guy named Manhook, which is apparently the king. And so this is an era where we still have kings and such. And um, this is a, a um, book where we do have magic. So um, the King Manhook actually has what he calls a cabal. That's a group of, of wizards or magic users, apparently, that he uses to help protect himself. Um, here's, a, here's a neat little quote. So as Oedipus was going through the streets, okay, uh, a little part of him, the part that had once been a police inspector, prowling the nights such as these for thieves and pickpockets in dark alleys, laughed out from the inside. Still your heart, old man, he said to himself. You were once the eyes staring back in the darkness. So as he's driving towards the palace, he's knowing it's really dark. It's very creepy. This is an odd feeling in the air right now. Very, very interesting. So when he gets to the palace, they pull him out of the palace. It seems like he feels like the driver is just a little bit rude by telling him to get out of it. Okay? Now, this palace is very ornate. It's very nice. It's considered the jewel of Adro. And so um, as he's entering in, um, he's noticing that um, he's, not fall he's not running across what they call a Heilman, or I guess the Heilman are the palace guards and stuff, which is um, ki kind of interesting interesting um there were no footfalls nor fountains running he heard once that the fountains only stopped for the death of the king surely not have been summoned here if manhook were dead so already he's observing that the fountains are off okay and um 
usually they only shut that off for the death of the king. And he's wondering, well, certainly that hasn't happened yet. So he's heading in. He runs across a um, another guy. And this guy um, is not wearing the uniform of a Heilman because the Heilmans, they have tall plumed hats. They're easy to recognize. Um, and so he's brought in. Okay. And they're taking him in and he's dressed like the military, the Adrian military, the Adrian Sorry, Adrian, A-D-R-A-N, military. And they brought him in. And um, he's kind of wondering what's going on. Now, apparently, Adrian military is run by this guy named Field Marshal Tomas. And so um, they're they're not telling Adam and everything. He's wondering what's going on. And they're just bringing him straight in. And they're sending him into the Diamond Hall where he can go to the King's Answering Room where he receives visitors and such. Okay. Um, let's see here. And it says here, a power struggle. Had the military been called in to deal with a rebellion? So he's already thinking, was there some sort of rebellion? Because apparently he's starting to mention that um, the king is not super highly thought of. He's spent a lot of money on the palace. He's made it very, very opulent. He's protected himself by this cabal of stuff. And there's several... Um, there's several problems within the country, such as the wings of Adam Mercenaries, Royal Cabal of the Mountain Watch, or even some great noble families, which could possibly be giving um, Manhook trouble. Um, the thing is, Manhook's surrounded by these by his cabal of, of wizards and magic users, which would be very hard to get rid of them, you know, in, in theory. So, huh, I guess we'll have to see what here is. Okay, so here we go. Now, he entered the diamond hall where the walls and the floor of scarlet, accented in gold leaf with thousands of tiny gems which gave the room its name, glittered from the ceiling in the light and the single lit candelabra. So once again, very ornate place. As he walks in, a body is laying in the shadows. Adam had bent over it, touched the skin. It was warm, but the man was almost certainly dead. He wore gray pants with a white stripe down the side and a matching jacket. A tall hat with a white plume, we talked about that, right? Lay on the floor some ways away. A heilman. The shadows played on the young, clean-shaven face, peaceful except for a single hole in the side of his skull and a dark, wet stain on the floor. So once again, I said this was 1800, so they are using what we call um, not rifles the way we know them today, but um, powder powder weapons. So basically, they would take gunpowder, stamp them into the guns, and then they would put um, steel balls or lead balls in them, and that's what they would shoot. And so um, powder, that's, that's, what, that's the term, powder. That's where that's coming from, which I think has something to do with um, the name of the series, the Powder Mage. So we're going to learn more about that as we go on. Okay, so Adamant now feels like he's right. There is some sort of rebellion. We got a, we got the Heilman dead. Maybe the, did they rebel? Um, what what could possibly happen? Is it did the Royal Cabal deal with them? What is what is the deal with this? So he continues to go on. He has a cane sword, and so he grips that tightly as he's coming in. He heads into the answering room, um, and. Uh, he's con and he notices that few outside these privileged sorcerers, this cabal, are actually even allowed in the room. Okay, um, let's see here. And this is what he sees when he enters the answer room. A man sat on the stairs to Adamant's right. He was older than Adamant, just into his 60th year, with silver hair and a neatly trimmed mustache that still retained a hint of black. He had a strong, but not overly large jaw, and his cheekbones were well-defined. His skin was darkened by the sun, and there were deep lines at the corners of his mouth and eyes. He wore a dark blue soldier's uniform with silver representation of a powder keg pinned above the heart, and nine gold service stripes sewn on the right breast, one for every five years of the Adrian military. His uniform lacked an officer's appellates, but the weary experience on the man's brown eyes left no question that he'd led armies on the battlefield. There was a single pistol hammer cocked on the stair next to him. He leaned on a sheathed small sword and watched a stream of blood slowly trickle down each step, a dark line on the yellow and white marble. Okay, so there's this, um, there's this obviously military leader sitting on the steps. He has a pistol ready to go. It's cocked. It's ready to be discharged. Obviously, he's worked for um, the military for a long time. It looks like um, nine gold service stripes and one for every five years. So nine times 45 years in the military. Wow, this guy's been around a long, long time. And 
Adamus says, Field Marshal Thomas. So this is the Field Marshal. Um, apparently, Adamant has met him one time, uh, a long time ago, at a charity ball um, thrown by a guy named Lord Almon. We may meet and find out more about him later, but that's all it says. And the Field Marshal, um, you know, doesn't remember him much. He says, I just have a terrible time with faces, okay? So they just have some nice chit-chat. And Thomas gets straight to the point. I summoned you on the recommendation of one of my marked. I guess marked is like his, some of his subordinates, the guys he trusts the most. Senka, he said you served together on the police force in the 12th district. Okay, so we know this guy was named Senka. He served with Adamat on the police force. Um, and so he was a former policeman. Now, Adamitz remembers Senka, a short guy. He had an unruly beard. And um, I, I didn't. He didn't know he was a powder mage. Okay, so let's let's kind of we're 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 gonna we're gonna look at this and say okay. Now I don't want to spoil anything, but apparently Tamas has a group, and these guys are called powder mages. And so um, Senka is in that group because he's a powder mage. And so it can be assumed that since he's part of Tamas's inner circle, that they are powder mages. So that's something that we want to tuck away in our heads for later. Okay. And apparently Tamas says they look for these guys, even if they're late bloomers and they don't learn about this ability until later on. Okay. So he wants his help. And apparently the field marshal plus him up says, hey, you're apparently you were once a fine investigator, a good sort of adro. Um, and Senka tells him he has a perfect memory. And apparently Adam, he still does. He's not an official inspector, but he still does it for work. So I guess he's kind of like a Sherlock Holmes. Or I guess um, there's some other great literary inspectors out there that don't actually aren't actually policemen anymore, but they they work for different people and such. So pretty good. So it looks like he's going to hire him, and I think he's even happier he's not part of the police force. That's what Thomas says, because then he can just go ahead and hire him. Okay, so Adamant gets to the point. Well, no, but sir, the Skyline Palace, there's a dead Hailman and the Diamond Hall, and where's the king? And so uh, Thomas says, he's locked himself in the chapel. And Adamant, it all clicks. You've staged a coup. And he's looking around. He looks up at the stairs, and there is... A, who they describe as a Delive man, a dark-skinned northerner. So it looks like um, there is some variety in the different types of people in this area. Um, I guess I think we can assume that this country is primarily Caucasian at this point, and that the that if you're from Delive, you're much dark skin, and you're from north of the country. So if you remember that map that we were looking at earlier, and so the Delive said there's lots of bodies, and Thomas gives him a name. His name's Sabone. Okay, so I think that's one of his inner circle. Okay, so they talk for a little bit. Um, we find out that Senka unfortunately died during the coup. We find out that Adamant um, was right. It is a coup. And Tomas staged the coup because there's issues. In fact, what does Tomas say here? Some say the Ajun royal cabal had the most powerful privileged soldiers in all the nine nations. Second to Kez, he said quietly, yet I've just slaughtered every one of them. Do you think I had trouble with an old inspector and a cane sword? So he's trying to get Adamant lined up because Adamant's like... You just committed a huge crime. You you've um, killed the you, you are going after the king, and apparently Tomas just confessed to taking out all the sorcerers of the cabal, which were apparently apparently very very powerful. So this isn't this isn't so good, um, or well we don't know exactly. Um, let's see here. So they talk a lot. They go back and forth about this coup thing and everything, um, and so now we get to the point. Okay. So, let's see here. Um, Tomas says they killed him in their sleep because that was the only way to really deal with the privileged. Okay. Um, let's see here. And apparently, here's he comes, he comes to the point of what the problem is. Okay. Is apparently, um, Ma Mahuk has been, like, totally taking advantage and he was getting ready to sign away the, um, the country to the empire of Kez, or at least, or at least all sorts of privileges and rights. So that looks like Adro was about to lose its independence. And apparently Tomas, being high up in the military, stepped back and said, no, we cannot have this happen. This is our country. I'm a patriot. And we're not going to let the king sell us down the river 
because he's incurred all these debts or whatever. And so that's an issue. Now, of course, we're dealing with sorcerers. So the last sorcerer who died, he threw this out. He said, you can't break Kresimir's promise. And what Thomas says, that's what the dying sorcerer said to me. It doesn't mean anything to you. And so here's the crux of it. They need the inspector to try, try to figure out what Kresimir's broken promise could be. So um, Automat's already thinking. He says a broken promise was a street gang that had about 43 members at one point. And, um, but they were basically all rounded up and they're massacred by powerful sorcerers with lots of brutality. So they're pretty sure that the King's Cabal had rounded these guys up at one time. So um, the Della soldier has appeared. He really needs Tomas because they're not done with the King. The King's like locked up and hiding from him right now. Okay, and so Thomas decides to go ahead and lay out what he needs the inspector to do. Find out why these mages would utter the words with their final breath. Um, maybe connected to the street gang, maybe not. Either way, he needs an answer because sorcerers, apparently. You know, it's a, it's a ma world with magic, so you, you got to be careful. And if somebody warns something or some sort of prophetic word pops out, you need to think about it. So that's what he's thinking about. Okay, well, really good, really good. So basically, they talk for a few more. They go ahead and go over into some issues. And Tomas, once again, goes over the fact that they were getting ready to be sold by these accords that they were trying to sign with Kez. And that was a big reason why he decided to um, stop this. And then he, um, and then, of course, you know, Tomas apparently has a problem with Kez because they executed his wife. And so that's part another part of Tomas's background why he probably don't want, doesn't want Kez to gain so much control in his homeland. So the field marshal is going to send Adama to get out there and find some answers and that's it. That is on um, chapter one. Now since I've been given commentary the entire time I'm not going to say a whole lot here at the end. I think that's how we'll use the format but a few interesting things that I thought was pretty cool is one this is powder so we're not using actual rifles we're using powder that's popped into weapons and we're using balls. There's lots of magic. In fact, the, in fact, the sorcerers are pretty powerful, so we're going to see a lot of this as we move on. There's an evil empire called Kez, which has been trying to get control of Adro, and um, Tomas is a patriot, also a hater of Kez, who has fought them many times, and whose wife was tortured and executed by them, has decided that he's not going to let the king take them blindly into this well guys i would love to hear your comments um let me know if you enjoyed this at all and we'll be getting ready for a chapter two um and depending on how long the chapter two might be one or two per time thank you so much for hanging out with me today this is kimmy say for the read along the promise of blood powder mage book series one by brian mcclellan i hope you guys have a great day catch you later Bye bye